Welcome to our new podcast, Man Cave United. This Man Cave has been 35 years in the making. So many legends around the wall, including many programs from the 50s through to present and a collection of jerseys back to the 70s. Welcome to the pod, my good mate Vim from the UK, our analyst. Tell us Howdy. a bit about yourself, buddy. Welcome to the new right. pod. Yeah, I'm I'm Vim. I've uh, I'm based in the UK, not in Manchester, unfortunately, but but down in London. Um, been an avid football fan pretty much my whole life. Been playing the game, hosting, refereeing, uh, analysing reports, watching the pundits, ev- absolutely everything. Love football, eat football, drink football, and everything else football. <laughs> <laughs> like a saw, mate. Like a saw. And now we've decided to. Uh take on a new podcast and uh, you know with everyone else and try and make it a little bit different a little bit more fun and uh, you know take it for a little ride and see how, how long it lasts so you know today's pod's going to be about our new revolution mm-hmm. Eric Ten Hag how do you feel yeah. about it mate and uh, mate, I'm how are we going to move uh, forward so excited you know because you know we've we've gone through some real ups and downs in football you know we we've we've you know, try to get managers after Fergie, you know, try to fix all these problems. I, I don't know. I mean, Fergie, Fergie just had a lot of charisma and no one else has been, been able to emulate it. You know, we, we brought in Moyes, which I think was an absolutely shocker of a show. <clears throat> How long did he last? 10, 10 months or something like that before he got sacked? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the last four games were, were held by uh, Ryan Giggs, yeah, if, I'm, yeah. if I'm correct. Oh, well, Car- yeah. Carrick won a couple, didn't he? <laughs> So, Carrick, yeah. yeah. Well, after yeah. Oli, after Oli yeah. was um, yeah. shifted over, yeah. yeah. But you know, LVG, ex Bayern manager, Dutch manager, you know, knows about Total Football 2.0. That was an exciting time as well. And every time you get a new manager, you know, you feel that excitement. You feel, wow, now we're going to see something different. And unfortunately, they've all let us down. You know, in in the in the long term. You get a little bit of a new manager bounce, you know, Jose wins a couple of trophies in his first season. Oli, you know, plays, goes on a winning streak initially as caretaker. LVG, I don't know, did we get a new manager bounce with him? Not really. Look, he's got a big task ahead of him. Look, it's probably, he's probably coming into a club, well, he is, he's coming into a club with the worst, you know, team since probably the, the late 1980s, you know, he's, He's got a real comprehensive rebuild ahead of him. And, you know, it's it's a massive task. And look, as a United fan, it's a little bit exciting, but you're a little bit reserved as well. So, you know, it's a massive job for him to um, to come in, you know. Fergie yeah. took over from Ron Atkinson and, you know, in 86. And, you know, even Fergie didn't start that well. So you He know, had a rocky have, start, yeah. Yeah. Even the fans have got a... Yeah, but I think the fans are going to learn from this as well. You know, they've got to be really patient here and, and um, you know, like Fergie said, back the manager. So, mm. but yeah, so back yeah, him, great. back him. I mean, we, we backed all of these new managers. I even backed Moyes. Um, but, you know, after a while, you just see a, a stale type of football. You don't see the players playing for the manager. You see problems. You see cracks starting to open up. You know, I've, I've been excited for every single manager that came along. I really have, but as things unfold, it just you just start to feel a bit disappointed in the way things are going, and I'm really hoping that we don't have this again with Eric Ten Hag. I'm really, really hoping, and I and I think that maybe he's going to have to get rid of some of these stale players to make it happen. Oh, definitely. He's, he's, he needs he needs to have a clean out. And look, he's I think he's already starting to do that with the backroom staff. Um, mm. <clears throat> You know, he's starting to get rid of a couple of, um, you know, he's well, the other day he got rid of the lead scout. So he, he's gone. Did, did he uh, get rid of them or was it well, the club? Lawler, you think, right? You would think that um, he may have came in and a couple of their chats that he's had since he's yeah. walked into Old Trafford. I mean, he's still got a job to do at Ajax, but um, you would think that may have been one of his requests. Not, you know, to get rid of the scouts. Scouting. Yeah, to sort out that. So, right. you know, you would think that'd be on the um, on the cards as well. So that was uh, Jim Lawler. 
Yeah. Apparently, he's been around for a long time. And the other scout that they removed was some guy called Marcel Boot or Boat. Yeah, and he was, was brought in. Was, it? Is that the over... was that overnight or because I didn't read that? Uh, well, it was just it was in the Manchester Evening News. So Jim oh, okay. Lawler been around for a long yeah. time. He left, yeah, yeah. and Marcel Bou, uh, B O U T, presuming it's a silent T, he was actually brought in as part of Louis, Ga Louis Van Gaal's backroom. Interesting. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, mate. Look, yeah. No matter what, Ten Hag's going to need the support of everyone at United. No matter what, you know, particularly yeah. the staff in the recruitment department, and um, you know. He has it all to prove, doesn't he? It's a big place, yeah. big job, and um, it's huge. You know what? Let's 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 just take a look at you know Eric and his um the way he sets up and stuff like that. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know because I think he's gonna be. I think he's gonna work well with Ralph, and um, yeah, you know we don't know how many players are gonna go, but they most certainly he loves his youth youth players, and um, you know I think, and I'm hoping maybe over the next. I know that, look, fourth spot's still available for us, um, you know, but I think, look, I'd love to see Hannibal start this weekend, you know. I thought he was... Oh, he was very, brilliant, eh? He was brilliant when he came on for that yeah. 10 minutes, you know. Um, so I'd like to see, like, so you've got a Langer, you have Hannibal, you know, Guy Nacho, uh, you know, maybe give those boys a chance over the over the next few weeks. I think there's five weeks to go. You know, yeah. Just, just so, you know, they've got a little bit of a taste of it. Ten Hag comes yeah. in. I'm sure he'll be a big, you know, part of his process. You know, you got Donny Vanderbeek. I'm sure he'll be excited to come back and, and he um, he will definitely have a resurgence in his career at Man United because in for two years he's been in, in the wilderness. You know, he's been sidelined, but he 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 developed as a player under Ten Hag, and he knows exactly the style of football that he wants. He will definitely have a resurgence. He's going to be. He's going to be pivotal in that midfield. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think look, I, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with um, Ajax or Eric Ten Hag, but I have done a fair bit of research on him, um, knowing that we're going to start this new pot up, and it's been coming for a while. This, you know, um, you know, he, he does prefer a four three three. You know, he's um, he said I've, I think. I, I heard he does play matches. three at the back as well. Sometimes he does yeah. play three at the back as well. Yeah. Well, that that'll be exciting, won't it? You know, to but yeah, we definitely need different players in the back line to play that. You know, we need some yeah. smart players, and at yeah. this stage we don't really have that. Something else as well, interesting, right? Because um, they are obviously interviewing a lot of his ex players, and there was one guy called William, William Jansen, perhaps who's a Danish player at all all. Utrecht, where Ten Hag used to be, and he he basically was an aging player that used to play as an attacking midfielder. Ten Hag recoached him to become a centre back, yeah, and he right. did actually quite well for the rest of his career as a centre back. Can you imagine that an, an attacking mid going back into a centre back role? It kind of look, redefines know... the way they do things in English football. Look, you don't see many people doing that, right? Look, I know in the look, and I know it's the Australian formation of football is not the biggest in the world or anything like that. But you know, I've been around football a long time, and as most people know, my daughter's playing. You know, when my daughter first started, she was she was like a striker midfielder, and mm -hmm. you know that when when she started playing at the at the top level, um, they they sort of at the age 13, 14, um, she wasn't scoring too many goals, but she's She's very good with a vision and stuff like that. And mm. they moved her mm. back to a left back, right back role. And, um, you know, and I did talk to the coaches and asked them why they did that. And um, they say, you know, the game's probably better for her, more opened up, you know. And um, I think that's a thing a lot of coaches do do. They, and when you listen to a lot of ex-players that do play in the backs, um, mm. they did first start as a striker and in attacking role and, and they have been led. I know Gary Pallister was one of those boys. Um, mm. You know, he he came in. He started as a striker, and you know, and then they moved him into the backs. You know, so mm -hmm. it's funny that, that yeah. You should talk about that. And, and sometimes it takes an eye over a, a good coach to see that a player is more suited in a different position. You know, whereas the coaches that we've had, everyone's pretty much stayed in their positions, and you don't see a lot of movement around the pitch. You know, you see people like Pep and, and Klopp, they rotate players around along the pitch. You know, you, 
Pep says that he wants his players to play in every single position on that pitch. Yeah. And that basically teaches you how to do every single role in, in, the, in, that, in that team. And that's why they can move around so fluidly. You know, you can have a, a centre-back going to, you know, going up for corners. And then you'll have a midfielder come back and act as a centre-back. I think it's fascinating that you can shift players around, teach them to do all the roles and become a more fluid and diverse team because of coaching methods. Look, I know like with that, I know we're getting a little bit off Eric here, but um, um, with Fergie... You well, this is say, this is all about Eric, isn't it? Right, this is what yeah, he does, right. yeah. Um, I know like with Fergie, he used to, his centre-backs, if they started travelling through the lines from the from the centre-half position, um, he used to say to them, just keep going forward. You know, and yeah, uh, that we don't see that now. We don't so a no. because our current team can't break down a team, and b yeah. you know, a lot of our players I think play with fear now. And um, but uh, you know, Eric's going to bring excitement, like, especially like you look at his win rate percentage at Ajax. It's up Fantastic, huh? Seventy three percent. Yeah, That's yeah. Sort of hardly crazy. any losses. Hardly any losses. Yeah, seventy nine. I've just got it up. Yeah, I was just having a quick look before. It was like seventy nine. Yeah. Seventy nine losses know. he's had, and two hundred and fifty six wins in four hundred and two matches. That's amazing. It's amazing. Look, if we can take that's amazing that into United. Look, at, you know, look. If we look at it. We we always talk about winning and everything like that. And I look. The first stage for me here is getting consistency through the team. And mm. that's, that's all I want. I, the people always say to me, how long do you think it's before we, we win another trophy? Well, we know mm-hmm. Klopp came into Liverpool. He didn't win nothing for the first, no. first couple of years. You know, the first, I still yeah. remember you know, Klopp comes in. I think they finished around 6th, 7th or 8th his first yeah. year in. The second and year, I remember... they a little higher. And then everyone yeah. just started rolling. You know? I don't want any and of it, these big signings anymore. No, and, and I remember as well that, that when Klopp was bought in, he was almost, you know, because he had so much success at Borussia, he was almost sort of teased and joked about in that first season that, oh, this manager didn't isn't what you expected him to be. But not none of us really knew what was going on in the man's mind as he was pay, effectively analysing all of his players and thinking, look, these guys don't really fit the bill for what I want. And so he was making these small changes here and there, getting getting the likes of Andrew, Andy Robertson and Terren, uh, uh, Trent to, to learn that fullback, wingback type of role, that hybrid role. We just didn't know in the first season what he was doing, but there was a lot of analysis going on. And, you know, I think he was getting a lot of stick that, you know, he hadn't fixed the problem and he had done so badly in his first season. But the club stuck with him. They realised they've got a great calibre manager and they need to give him time and let him choose the players that he needs to fit his style of football. And that's what Eric Ten Hag's going to need. He's going to need exactly that. Give him the time that they gave Klopp. Give him the, the money, the resources, and, and the power to bring in the players that you need to make your style of football work at our club. Look, that's the, how we can back him. The thing that Klopp's done well, and Liverpool, as much as we can say Liverpool gave the, gave the resources to Klopp, Klopp wasn't mm. spending big money. He wasn't he spending wasn't big, spending yeah. Money. He was just playing yeah. the right players, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what United need to do. Like these, yeah. These guys that we're currently got, it's like a superannuation package for them. You know, they've yeah. all come in. They, they're all, you know, well, they're not big names, but Ronaldo and you know Bruno's created a name for himself. And you know, we've got Sancho. Sancho's come in. We've been wanting him for a while. <clears throat> yeah. We're, you know, I'm reading now. Rashford, Rashford looks like he might be going to Barcelona. You really? Know, um, <clears throat> well, that's what I read this morning. Whether it's true or not, it could be just paper talk again. Could be. But, um, but yeah, we need these players that want to work for Ten Hag. We need want the play for the badge, and you know, and just, mate, I'll get back to his tactics for a, li- a little bit. But like, Mo Salah summed it up in his his um, post analysts after the game, you know, yeah. he enjoyed um, playing against United purely because most most of the time when he was attacking, it was 1v1. And, yeah. You know, and Liverpool thrive on that. We need to mm. learn that pack defending, you know, and, and Ten Hag's all about that as well, you know. Let's create that 3v1 defending as well as having players drop in, you know. Yeah. We'll attack with, 
with what we'll, we'll attack with an eight and ten, but then when we defend, we'll drop in with two sixes. You know, so we need players that can really understand his concept. Yeah, you know, these players they, don't understand a concept at the moment. They just don't get it. They don't. And and the reason we find it difficult to play against uh, you, um, Liverpool and City is because when one of our players does get the ball, they are hunted down like packs, uh, a pack of wolves. You see three or four players approaching that player and they put him under so much pressure that he doesn't know how to get out of it. He's got no one to pass to or he has to make a rash pass, a really a hasty pass. And they often end up giving the ball. I saw it so many times against Liverpool and City, you know, past couple of years, that they they can't cope under pressure, and and the the opposition, they they purposely do that. They come and kind of hound you, pressure you, that you literally don't have any time or space to think, you know. And what players love is they want time and space on the ball. You give me the ball, I want a bit of time and space so I can look up look up where my players are, and then I can figure out the pass to make, and. Liverpool and City do not allow you that time to make those kind of or have those type of thoughts as to where that ball's going to go, and and that's it. That they they fluster you, and they they've always done it to us, and we, we can't do the same back, unfortunately. It's um, because the players not, not yet. panic under pressure. They panic under pressure, and we need players yeah. that that don't panic under that pressure and are not afraid to lose the ball. You can see players like Wambasaka and even Shaw. Um, yeah. You know, Tellers is probably. Uh, and the exception to that, he's probably a bit too casual. Um, you know, Tellez, uh, not Tellez, Shaw and uh, Wambasaka, they yeah. consistently, especially Wambasaka, just as soon as he gets the ball, he's that nervous in attack. You know, just wants to give it away. He just wants, yeah. he doesn't care. He just, I, he was trying to do one touch passing out from the right back position. And every time the ball came to him, he just gave it. He just hit it yeah. into midfield. And Liverpool were always picking it up. Yeah, we, we Can't play football like that. Out. We always talk about Wambasaka being a good defender, but this day and age, that's not the type of football we want to play. You know, he uh, tackles well. He tackles well. You know, he's just need, not very good at anything you else. Players, you need players that can fall into his position, into a defender's position, when, when mm. they do go forward. You know, and not make it about themselves. You know, I think Ajax. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was last season. Um, they conceded. Like, and you wouldn't say Ajax has got the best defence. You know, but they've just got players that are very calm on the ball. I think they only conceded like twenty but it, goals all season. Yeah, but it's not matches. it's not only it's not only down to the three centre backs or the four four defenders. The whole team defends. And the defense yeah, starts right. from the front. Yeah. The, they they set traps in in the final third, the opposition third, to win the ball back literally outside the twelve yard box. Once they get the ball back, you've got three, four, five, six players of AX there ready as options to pass, confuse the defenders, and bang, hit the goal. Well, they they're, score they're, most they're of their goals by setting team. traps. They're, they're an, an aggressive, aggressive team. team they set traps. Down, yeah, and I, I've, I've, I've watched how they do it, what they'll do. Let's say, let's supposing um, Luke Shaw has the ball in left back. So the one of the attacking three will go to him with pace, you know, without any time to, for him to think about what to do, and they'll put him under pressure. They'll cut out the pass. So they'll block his vision to cut out the pass to, to other players. Then you've got two Ajax players just behind that attacking player ready to pick up the ball. So that player will look sure panic. He'll give away the ball. Those two players pick it up, and then you've got two other players on the other side who will then receive a cross or a, a, a sideways pass. And that, that's what they do to set traps, and that's how Man United are going to be learning to to play football now under Ten Hag. I think people in people in Australia are very lucky, to be honest with you. We've got the preseason tour here, and it's going to be very exciting. You know, well, usually on most preseason mm. tours, um, the fans get to watch two or three training sessions. So it'll be very on that excited and that pump for preseason. I wish yeah. there wasn't any more games this year, this year. <laughs> but, you know, and I know with our supporters club, you know, um, Tom who does another pod podcast for our supporters club, he'd be frothing at the mouth for uh, for this preseason because he, he really analyses the game really well. So mm. you know, I might be hanging around him down in uh, Melbourne <laughs> just to listen to his thoughts when they're training mm. and stuff like that. It's going to be an exciting time preseason, and you know, look. You got to, you got to look. United press have done well again. Like they, we've just been battered by Liverpool, and then they've come out, announced Eric, and um, 
you know, sort of got the fans excited again and you know, for next season. And yeah, you know, they they really do add in United at mm. times. It's like it's like being in a relationship sometimes, you know, one minute, you know, you're loving your bride to death, and next minute, you know, you she's she's killing you or you're killing her, one of the two, you know. Mm. Uh yeah. But People's emotions are often linked to football. You know, when, when the team is winning, you feel great. When the team is losing and suffering, you feel kind of, you feel bad. And we don't, we don't intentionally do it, but our, our, our feelings do get linked to our club. And sometimes we don't have any real control over it. it just, it's just the way it is. <laughs> is um, is um, Daly Blind still at, at Ajax? Yeah, he? yes, he is. He is he? So, uh, yeah, he is. And, and well, uh, you know, it was, it was foolish to let him go. Now, who was it that let him go? Was it Van Gaal? Yeah. Fellow Dutchman? I mean, this is the, the stupid thing that Van Gaal did. But basically, um, Ten Hag, the way he sets up his team is that he, he completely changes and revolutionizes the way they coach. So uh, I, at AX, he had additional training grounds put in and he had grids uh, marked out on them. So you didn't just have the regular football lines of, you know, the, the semicircle and, and so on in the center circle. He had grids, literal grids in there. And he would want players to occupy uh, every space in the grid uh, to, to literally, um, and I, I don't know the details of it, but, and they won't tell, say too much about it because obviously these are trade secrets. These are his trade se secrets. But he, he has a vision. And if the players weren't following what he was doing, you know, in terms of occupying spaces, occupying pitches, you know, out of possession, in possession, he would stop the game, constantly stop the game. No, you're in the wrong spot. You need to go back there. And it took a while for the players to understand. And they, they, they couldn't get into the flow of the game because he kept stop starting, stop starting. And it, they found they said that the way he talks is a little bit wooden, a bit rigid and clumsy, with a lot of eh, eh, or eh, you know, a lot of pauses. But they they then started to understand what he's trying to do, and the kind of football he's trying to implement. So he knows quite clearly what he wants. The players took a little while to understand it, and obviously we're gonna we're gonna have to we're gonna see that. I mean, ideally he'd want to bring in some players from Ajax, but surely they're not going to give up you know, their manager and a lot of their best players. I think we're going after Anthony because, you know, we're, we're quite weak on that right-hand side. Um, but it's quite fascinating. Like, think Donnie, the methods Donnie he'll he'll employ. That, do you think Donny will come that main man? Because he, yeah. he really came in for Bruno, didn't he? So <clears throat> it'd be very interesting to see how Donny Vake, or, Donny or, Van der Beek is... Um, yeah, or was it, or was it um, Pogba? Because it wasn't there wasn't there doubts of Pogba leaving and they needed someone to replace him. Okay. I well, I, I thought it was Pogba. Oh, think, oh sorry, the, I forgot to mention. Him, so. No, he has, yeah, he has. He was he was pivotal for his Champions League campaign. So anyway, what I forgot to say is that because Ten Hag's coaching coaching methods are quite tricky and quite difficult for the for the entire team to understand, he has a couple of generals to help him convey that message. And Daily Blind was one of his generals. Daily Blind is there to help translate that coaching style and method to the players. Yeah, so, right. you know, we missed a trick with Daily Blind. Yeah, but you know what? It was probably a good career move for him. You know, he... It was brilliant for him, yeah. Not yeah. good for us. No, not good for us. But, I mean, do you think he would have went well under the other managers that we've had? I don't, I don't think so. No player he would have got fed up. He would have got yeah, fed up and he would have probably been up. shipped out. Yeah. yeah, but you know, at his age, and he's he's literally a lieutenant in Ajax. At his age, how old is Daily Blind now? I mean, he, he does look like a much older chap nowadays. Let's see how old he is. Do you want to have a guess? Oh, I reckon he'd be about twenty-seven. He's just turned thirty-two. Oh, really? Yeah. So he's peaking Born in... now, isn't he? Peaking now, born in 1990. When he was with us, he looked like a young chap, full head of hair. And now he's pretty much like me and you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Getting a bit shiny what? on top. <laughs> in, in all this, I'm, I'm that excited for Eric, um, Eric Ten Hag. I just, yeah. I want to see our team, you know, become that possession-based team. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we miss that. Like we struggle yeah. to keep past, keep keep the ball for more than four or five passes. 
Yeah, yeah. The only time I think we get five passes is when we go back. You know? Yes. And then we go sideways. You know, it, it's... Yeah. And Van so, Van Gel Van Gel tried to implement that, and do you remember how boring it became? It was sideways and back passing, yeah. sideways and back passing. It was the most boring football we'd ever seen. Yeah, oh, look, well, I just want to see. Look, and I'm not, I'm not expecting too much. I just want to see. Mm. I just want to see us become a football team again. I want to yeah. see see our club become a club that I remember because it's not mm-hmm. even close to the club that I grew up with, and. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's very frustrating to see. It's, I feel like, and I'm sure most fans feel the same way that we're we're in a stranglehold and we just can't can't get out of it. And you know, we often speak about um, other teams coming to Old Trafford or even just playing Manchester United, and and they play better football than us. Yet we're mm-hmm. the ones that have spent 1.2 billion dollars, and um, you know, we just at the moment we're a selfish club. And, mm. um, you know, it's, I know we talk about Glazers out and stuff like that. And, you know, most, most people, including myself, wouldn't mind seeing that changeover. But mm-hmm. look, if they're going to stay, we just need them to support the, the manager. We need yeah. a whole new, uh, we need new staff in, in the club. You know, yeah. we need, you know, new scouts. We need, we need, really need, Again, and it's what this podcast is called, a revolution of yeah. um, Manchester United. And we need to, we need to start um, developing the academy as well, because that, that has suffered as well. You know, it's from the academy that we start to, you know, n- nurture a new crop of players for the club. And, you know, that's, that's the bedrock of, well, of Manchester the, United. Well, that, that's the thing. There's so many players out on loan at the moment. Look, we've got our, we've got our under-18s. They're in the Youth Cup final. I think uh, I'm not sure if it's next week against Nottingham and not is it against Forest? Yeah, Nottingham Forest. I think uh, they're playing in the Youth Cup final, which is a big thing for our club, mate. We've been mm. winning Youth Cup finals since the 1940s, 1950s, mm-hmm. you know, and and even right through the 60s, 70s, you know, 80s, 90s. I've got endless programs, you know, um, mm. you know, before they got wet. Um, mm. you know, uh, yeah, well, because you, 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 you obviously been working on this man cave for how long is it now? How many years? Yeah. Well, mate, I've been like, I've, I've probably, it's all come together probably in the last 10 years, but I've definitely yeah. been collecting probably for the last 30 to 40 years. You know, I'm very yeah. fortunate. I had an uncle that was, um, from the UK Maltese, yeah. but he was season pass holder and, um, at Old Trafford, you know, I had a shop in Altrincham and he used to send me, he used to go back and forth when he come to Australia and bring me stuff. And, you know, I'm, I've been very lucky as a, as a um, long distance supporter, or as mm-hmm. we say now, a worldwide red. And, mm. um, you know, so, and I've got a good mate, our chairman, um, mm-hmm. Mark, who, who I get a lot of our, a lot of my stuff through as well. And I've got some really good contacts through him that, I've been fortunate enough to um, you know, be able to get a lot of stuff. So, and you, yeah. you've been, you've got programs from the '60s and stuff before Munich and stuff like that, right? Yeah, you've been collecting programs from, yeah. from, yeah, from the '50s and yeah, Munich. Yeah, you know, the, that 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 is the that is the part of the club that I, I really love about Manchester mm. United. Uh, you know, the no club's got a. I feel no club's got a history like United. And, mm. you know, it's probably been, you know, we talk about the Busby Babes and we talk about the Munich air crash and that probably brought Manchester United um, fans together. You know, they've always had mm-hmm. big crowds, but then when uh, Manchester United had the Munich um, air crash, you know, we're, we're going to be celebrating the 65th anniversary next year, February 6th. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to be um, booking my flights to go over. Um, mm-hmm. for that next year. So I'm pretty excited about that. And, you know, but for our younger fans, and I'll always maintain this, you, you can you can love a club as much as you want, but until you know the history, uh, history of the club, and this is something I try and drum into my girls who are United fans, and they don't watch every game, but they do know things about uh, the Munich air crash. And, you know, they do know, you know, 
survivors like Harry Gregg or players that passed away like um, Duncan Edwards. And, um, you mm. know, but play, Who is probably I, the best player of his time, no? Duncan Edwards? Duncan Edwards. Well, yeah, look, I mean, I, I haven't, I never watched him or, or anything like that, but you read books on it and you talk to older generation um, supporters and, and um, that I'm lucky enough to, to know. Um, and they, they, they always talk about um, just how good he was, how big a man he was as a kid and stuff like that. And, and then from that time we had, you know, my uncle Bill, who got me into the supporters, uh, got me into, you know, supporting Manchester United. He was a massive fan of George Best, you know, and, mm. and you talk to any of the supporters through the sixties um, who got to watch George and, you know, it's just next level stuff. You know, <clears> George was brilliant. Yeah. The way the way that ball used to stick to him, it was it was like watching the uh, a messy. The pitches that he of, was on, you know, it was atrocious, and he still kept the yeah. ball. Yeah, it's like the ball was stuck look, to him, and the way he used to dribble past players. I mean, it's how the hell did you do that? You know, I used yeah. to wonder. Look, we got Bobby Charlton. Bobby Charlton was yeah. in the Munich air crash. He, he yeah he, he was there in in fifty eight. He was in youth cup finals, and you know. He went through to 68, won the Champions League. He won, he's won the league a few times. He, you know, the won the FA Cup, you know, and and he's he's been massive in this club um, as mm. a player, Sir Bobby Charlton. You know, unfortunately, you know, fortunately he's still alive, but he's he's probably not around the club as much as he is because he's aging and he's, um, you know, he's got got that dementia now, and um, you know, and and it's really a shame that. Um, you know we're losing these players, but that's 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 mm. life, and you know, life. and this is this is this is why I <clears> try and encourage young supporters to to look back on on players and look back on our you know our history of our club. Yeah, right. yeah, but history is valuable. You know, it's it's yeah. it it's it you know it sets a precedent for for the future generations, for the current generation, current crop of players. You know, there's so much history entwined with this club that players that come to our club to play, they need to understand this history and need to know what it means. What are the roots of this club? You know, and it's would, important that those those messages are still conveyed. I, I would really love Eric Ten Hag to um, to really push that to our youth players and um, yeah, you know, when when we sign youth players and you know, it's not it's not like the old days where you know you had that hundred hundred kilometer radius where um, you couldn't take players outside that. We can now buy youth players from Brazil, you know, yeah. um, anywhere around the world, you know. I'd love to see a young Australian there, you know, mm. um, yeah, pushing the club forward um, and pushing our country forward with, with football. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I want them to, when they get interviewed for Manchester United, the first place they go is in the, in the museum. You know, mm -hmm. we've built this, we've built this club up and, and yeah, we've got a we've got a trophy cabinet that's second to none, and um, you know the first place they should be walking is through that, then into the manager's office to sign that contract, you know, yeah, or even signing that contract in the museum, yeah, you know? to, just to get them, just get that blood pumping like the like we feel it, you know, like just yeah. talking about it now, I, I get excited, you know. So, but it, it it feels like the current crop of players have lost their way. You know, they, they don't seem as part of this club as they as they should or as players have been in the past. They really have lost their way and it's like they don't even care. You know, it's, yeah, look, it's the club has, has lost its way in the past few years and that's it's a real shame. A lot of these players can't handle that, that pressure from Manchester United and they can't they can't handle the pressure from the fans and but you but know, you just is, gotta go is, out there and perform. I mean look at look at Hannibal you know? Look at Hannibal Meshbury, okay? He, he committed a few fouls, but the guy was a live wire. He was chasing the ball down. And this you is have what to United just go, out, go out there. Yeah, and you just go out on the pitch and you give it your all. Give it 100%. Don't, don't come in and, you know, just jog around and make half-hearted tackles and try to, you know, g give Mane lots of time and space on the ball so he can turn around and make a, a, a pass. Don't give him time and space to think. Hunt them down. Put pressure. Go, you know, run your socks off. It's not much to really ask for, you know. You just give it your all when you're on that pitch, and the players are just not doing that anymore. 
No. Well, look, you know, we we again, we do, they, the players and that shouldn't be shouldn't be even thinking about what's happening at the top end of Manchester United, like with the Glazers or anything like that. They should be just mm. there, ready to perform each week. But I think yeah. players these days have got too much of a say. You know, the the manager should be. You had you had Ollie, the yes man. You know, yeah. You got Mourinho that was quite happy to you know um, put shit on to, his players to, in a press conference to, to, to throw like his that. players under the bus. Yeah, that's right. You know, you know, but our players shouldn't be questioning anything the manager's got to say. You know, and and this is what another thing I want out of Eric. If anyone anyone comes in and decides to, you know, back chat him or or doesn't agree with anything he says, read mm. the player. Read the player straight away like Fergie did. You know? Or, uh, you know, to that some, or, or some discipline. Yeah, I mean, you know, put him in the reserve team or something. Put him That's in, it. you know, in another team and say, look, unless you buck up your ideas, son, you're not going to play for the first team. So you need to go out and prove yourself. I'm going to give you to my assistant coach or reserve coach manager. Go and play with him for the next six weeks. All right? No, and if you want to think- earn your way back into the first team, then... Pull, pull, you know, pull your socks up and work hard. A big yeah. thing for me. There, there has to be discipline. discipline. Look, a big thing for me. Look, and I showed you a photo. I showed you a, a photo of my uncle Bill with um, David Beckham as a seventeen-year-old. Now that 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 photo, and I didn't tell you that photo was taken in Malta on a um, at the Malta Supporters Club. Okay, David mm-hmm. travelled with Paul Parker, um, Steve Bruce. I think Mark Hughes was there as well. Now, he was only an apprentice, and he's mm. he's gone to Malta to Malta the Malta Supporters Club with the first right. grade players, with the first grade players, you know. And I, I, I want to know these days is is our first team bonding with our youth players? Our youth players are bonding with our first. Uh, do they do they sit? Doesn't there feel like together? it. Do they sit Doesn't there feel and like together? It. Do they do they share stories together? You know, um, this is a big thing that's gone out of the club for me. You know, but they, yeah. they need, the youth players need heroes. And you yeah. know, when I played football, I, I had, I had, you know, players like Maradona. I used to look up to. Um, yeah. You know, I used to, I used to watch a World Cup, and I still remember him flicking the ball up in the middle of the pitch the first time I saw him in '86. And, you know, straight away after that game, I went outside and I started playing, trying to do that trick, you know. And did you, um, were you managed, did you, were you able to do that or not? Yeah, I still do it now. I love it. When I warm up my daughter, I still, up. Do the, yeah, I still do the same tricks all the mm. time, you know. I used to watch players like Paolo Rossi, you know, the Italian striker from 1982. Yeah. You know, these are players I used to sit there, you know, and we never got to watch a lot of football here live. But I'll tell you mm. what, when a World Cup was on, I was excited, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I used to try and analyse these players and, you know, I just, I just felt, fell in love with the game. And, mm. and you know, Roberto Baggio, because in Australia, the Brilliant. Italian football was the number number one we used to watch here a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, you had, you had Scalacci, you know, players like that. Yeah. Uh, they, they just used to get me buzzing, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and then... And then further on, you, I used to follow like Beckham, Brian McClare, you know, um, you know, players like Brian McClare. He was the first player to come in and, you know, score thirty goals since since George Best, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and he was a poacher and he worked hard for every goal he, he had. And then yeah, you know, you had Beck, Skulls, Neville. They were all my age. They were our age, and I used to dream about these blokes. You know, thinking <laughs> I'm a young boy. I'm the same age as these boys, and they're playing. They're playing in the first team at Old Trafford with all these players like Roy Keane and Eric uh, Cantona, and you know, it just got me buzzing all the time. Yeah, yeah, you know? can you imagine? So, I, I wanted to share um, something with you, um, and you probably saw it earlier. So obviously, you know, the past ten years haven't been that great for us, right? But since Fergie left, 2012-13 season. Guess who have been the biggest spenders in the world at club football since then, Mate. up to now? You're going to be shocked. Mate, I've... I've what, the I'll, biggest I'll tell spenders? you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll start from sixth place, okay? Yeah. So in sixth place, in the past 10 years, 2012, 2013, 
they, the net spend, right? So this is spend expenditure of all your outgoings and your incomings. So your net spend, because you know when you when you sell a player, that comes off your uh, your total spend. So your net spend, uh, Juventus have been in sixth. That's 468 million. Arsenal in fifth, 486 million. Barcelona in fourth, 542 million net spend. Third is PSG, 785 million. Second is Manchester City, 821 million net spend. And guess who tops it? Manchester United. Manchester United with 897 million. Absolutely. So almost 900 million in the past 10 years. And what do we have to show for it? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. That's disgraceful. And if you look at the trophies of that top six, we are, we're scratching the surface with one or two or three, yeah. maybe. And where's, um, where's, where's Liverpool on that? Uh, Liverpool are in 14th position, 289 million. 289. To show what their recruitment's like, isn't it? Yeah, a third of what we spent. Bayern Munich is on 303. And they, they top the league every year. Yeah. It's shocking. Mm. It, it's Chelsea, you know, with a billionaire owner like Abramovich, 344 million. So, you know, our club is in some serious problems, man. It's, you know, the Glazers have been spending, but they've not spent it well. They have not uh, spent it well. Well, they, they, look, let's, let's, let's summarise summarize and start winding the pot up a little bit. Like, yeah. for me, I just want to, I just, I mean, I've said it a couple of times in this, I just want, I just want Eric Ten Hag to come in and, you know, and take basically the, the club by the horns, you know, I'll mm -hmm. use other language but I, I i really wanted to come this is a this is a pg is, show adam pg that's show correct. That's for correct. our younger I'm, viewers around the world I'm trying to be a, a lot more mature about this podcast <laughs> 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 and uh i would love him just to come in take the bulls by the horn i don't think he's going to make an instant impact i think it's going to take a little while to um you mm -hmm. know get rid of players and you know Get new players around the around Ralph Rangy. Uh, sorry, players. Yeah. New new um, staff around Ralph. Um, yeah. I just look. I want this revolution to work, just to get us back to where we yeah. were. Yeah. And I'm not talking about winning, winning, winning league after league after league. I just want us to start being competitive, because mm -hmm. even though we're in sixth spot, or I think I win six now. Um, Sixth. We're, yeah. we're not competitive. We're, we're not a competitive team. And I don't even know how the hell we're in six. Um, it's just that, like tonight, I'll still go out to our supporters club and um, watch the game with our members because I'm, I'm proud of the badge and um, I'm not proud of the players. Definitely not. And, um, you know, no. I just I just want this new revolution of um, Eric to come in, take the, the, the club by the, the horns. And, mm -hmm. you know, I want the Glazers... I want the Glazers to prove themselves, prove their worth to the club, you know, um, give Eric the resources he needs and, and, and just listen, get football people around the club. And, um, I, you know, they, they do, they do. The Glazers have been backing their managers with funds. We, we can see this from this, from these stats, but who's making the decisions on which players to buy? Has it been at board level or has it been at, you know, senior executive level or, or management level, upper management level, or has it been the manager themselves? And it seems to me, and from what I'm hearing, is that it's been the upper echelons of the club that have been making the decisions to buy players. They need to give that control to Ten Hag. And that's the reason, that's the reason Ten Hag was stalling on signing his contract, that he wants to have a say and control over the players that he buys. It shouldn't be the board level. It shouldn't be the, the, the senior manager making those decisions. It should be him. The club should revolve around him like it used to with Fergie. And as players come in, they should never have an elevated status or a higher status than the manager. The club and the manager are synonymous. The football is all about the manager and his style of football, like it was with Fergie. You know, when we brought in Pogba, we brought in... Um, Sancho and lots of other marquee playings, they they elevate the player to a much higher status than the manager. And that was a big mistake. The play, it gets to the players' heads. They think they are more valuable 
than the manager themselves. It's not. It's the manager who's number one. It's Eric Tagenhan who's number one, and he should be the most popular figure, and he should be the first person you think of when you think of Manchester United. It has to become like that again. When you thought of Manchester United in the past, when Fergie was around, you thought of Fergie. It wasn't the players. The players were all, they all fell into rank under him. He's at the top of that pyramid, and that's how it needs to go again, in my view. Well, mate, that's a great way to end the pod right there. Mate, you've, you've put your point forward, and I couldn't agree more. I want to thank everyone for um, tuning in. Uh, remember to like, share, subscribe. Uh, Man Cave United, the revolution has started with Eric and um, Vim. I want to thank you for joining us, and I can't wait to do the next one. Hopefully, we have our other our other um, email guests. Join, yeah. guests join us next uh, next show. And um, remember, everyone, give us a chance, like, share, subscribe, and uh, we'll catch you next time with um, another exciting pod. See you later. Take care, guys. See you next time.